Hello, I'm Carl Wells. This is Point to Point. My guest today is Elaine Dobbin, a well-known personage in the St. John's social scene for sure. She's also a philanthropist, a volunteer, and a well-known advocate for autism and the Autism Society of Newfoundland and Labrador. And on a personal note, I can tell you that she makes the best coconut cream <laughs> pie known to men. You do? Well, thank you for that. It's <laughs> nice to know. Elaine, um, you were born Frances Elaine Davis. Correct. In Holyrood. Mm -hmm. um, your mom and dad uh, operated a lounge in Holyrood, correct? Well, actually, it was my grandparents that started it. Um, and my m to keep my mom from moving away, they gave it to her and my dad because they felt she was going to move to New York with the rest of the Davis family. So when your dad passed, uh, I mean, your mom had to look after the family. She had to put bread on the table somehow. Did she continue operating she this business? She did. She worked very hard. She had a... Uh, my younger sister, Maureen, uh, was six years younger than me, and she... Um, my mom... There were five of us, three, uh, four girls, one boy, and my mother always said, by the way, she'd rather have another ten boys than have another girl. <laughs> but... Um, we, we, we grew up with a, a restaurant, gas bar, boarding. Back in those days, it was called a, a hotel, but you wouldn't label it that today. I guess you'd say it was more of a B&B a &B with a bar. A restaurant came later, um, and the gas bar came. And did my mother all, all, all of the kids work in, in the business? Oh, gosh, did we ever. Um, from, as, from chopping up potatoes for making French fries, to up on the Trans-Canada Highway selling lobsters. <laughs> we did, and certainly you wouldn't do that today. Put two young girls up on the side of the Trans-Canada no. without any cell phones or anybody yeah. selling lobsters, yeah. but we did it. Um, now, when you were 14, I believe, you moved to Long Island, New York. Yeah, my dad's... What's the story there? My dad's Aunt Mary and Uncle Jack uh, they didn't have any children, and they felt that I actually they wanted to adopt me after right after my dad passed away, mm -hmm. and one of the reasons was because I think I was most like my father, so they told me and everybody else told me, and they they wanted to adopt me. My mother said no. When she becomes of age, if she wants to stay, fine, but not until that time, and. We had the, um, were fortunate enough to, on occasions, go to New York in the summertime. And this one particular summer, uh, they asked me to stay, and I said yes. Until I got the letter from my mother saying how um, my friends wanted to know when I was coming home, so and so was having a party, uh, will I be there? And I started to cry, and I think that was on a Thursday or a Friday. Sunday, they had me on an aircraft mm -hmm. flying back to Newfoundland. <laughs> and um, eventually, you went to Holy Hurt. I did. That was my payment <laughs> mm. and, <laughs> for not staying in New York. And uh, while you were at Holy Hurt, you became a prefect, and you also became Girl of the Year at Macaulay Hall. Yes, I did. I, how, actually, I forgot all about that. One, how does one become Girl of the Year at Macaulay I'm Hall? I'm not sure. I mean, how did you find that? I, I, that was, um, I think it was just voted up on within the mm -hmm. girls living in the hall, um, the boarders there. And um, they're from all across the island, especially um, from communities that didn't have high schools. Mm -hmm. And we just developed friendships, and we became each other's best friends. Mm -hmm. And every now and then, I run into somebody that we, I met there, and uh, we reminisce about the wonderful times we had at Macaulay Hall. I guess it was when you were still a, a teenager. Uh, you got involved in beauty pageants, which were a big deal back then, because yeah. all the girls wanted to be in beauty pageants. And you actually became Miss Conception Bay South. You became Miss Come Home Year which and Miss Newfoundland. They're having the anniversary for Come Home Year in Holyrood this year. Um, yeah, I, it was, um, that was my stepfather's doing. Mm -hmm. We were very blessed that my mom did remarry a wonderful man. His name was Hubert Keogh. Came into a ready-made family of five. He was an engineer. 
working with the uh, provincial government with the Department of Municipal Affairs. Mm -hmm. And his brother, uh, Bill Keogh, he was the Minister of Mines and Resources. So I don't know if there was a little bit of something going on there, but he was very good at what he did. And when he um, came into our family, he took a real interest in all of us, uh, but particularly me, apparently, because I was the one that used to keep bringing him back by the hand. My mother had the bar, and he liked to drink on Fridays when they finished work at the, uh, at the time. Then he was with the uh, um, Golden Eagle Ore Refinery in Holyrood. Oh. And that was before he went with the Department of Municipal Affairs or uh, Mines and Resources. Hmm. Anyway, he, um, I was down there one day uh, along with a bunch of friends. It was a big thing, the oil refinery starting in Holyrood. And he said to me, run up to your mother's and bring us all back some fish and chips. Hop on your bike and go. And I said, I don't have a bike, but I'll go get the fish and chips. And he gave me the money, and I went up, came back. Lord and behold... That very Friday, a new bike was delivered to my house. <laughs> I was down at my friend's house, Patsy Burns, and I got a phone call from a Mary Morrissey, and she said, you better come quick. There's a new bike here for you, but it's not going to be here long. <laughs> when I got up, my mother, I heard my mother saying as I walked in, if I want my daughter to be killed on a bloody bike, mm -hmm. um, I will darn well buy her one myself. I don't need a drunk to do it for me. <laughs> and... Uh, anyway, I did manage to keep the bike. Uh, he became a fixture, and he married my mom mm. and had five children. But he was the one he, he got, got us all, tried to get us all involved in public speaking um, and the contest, of course, um, came along with, with that. My sister Pat, by the way, was also um, involved in the same. And she, actually, she was the first one, so she kind of paved the way. Oh, I see. Made it easier for me. I didn't, to, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, is it true that you had the dealership for Wonder Bra, and you went in your car and sold Wonder Bras all around Newfoundland? I was known as the boob lady. <laughs> 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 and what was funny was um, there, were, there were really no females at the time. There was one other, uh, Debbie Beard was her name, and she did the same thing. Yeah. Uh, in 1969, you attended the Liberal Leadership Convention, and you were a Crosby girl. I was, and I still have the uniform today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how did you end up as a Crosby girl at that convention? Actually, it, Brian O'Day mm -hmm. uh, was involved, and yeah. he got together the most of the girls, but he was the one that asked me to be, and I was happy to do and I loved every minute of that as well. Yeah. Mm. It was quite the convention. It was. I mean, I, I cried my heart out when John Crosby yeah. lost. Yeah. Uh, for obvious reasons, because we all worked so hard. But I also felt he was the best man to lead us mm. um, into yeah. the future. So uh, I want to talk to you about um, all of the work you d you've done over the years as a, a volunteer. Um, I know a lot of people associate your name with, and rightly so, autism mm -hmm. and the Autism Society. But your association with the organizations, uh, uh, you know, be it for physically disabled or the CNIB or what have you, that, that goes back 40 years. Well, this that, is not a new thing for you. No. Actually, when I first got involved with uh, doing volunteer work, was at the rehab center down in Pleasantville. Right. And I think I was about 18 at the yeah. time. And I met this one little child, God bless his heart. Um, he, his family, were, I believe, were from St. Anthony, so could not come in to town to visit on a regular basis. So I really took him under my wing. And I never forget one time I went to put him back down, and he cried his heart out. He didn't, didn't want me to leave. Mm -hmm. And that opens up your heart. Mm -hmm big time and I guess that was the beginning of knowing I can do things to help other people. Mm. Yeah, and I've been doing it ever since where I can. Now in the early 90s I guess uh, you hooked up with Craig Dobbin. I did. One of the Actually it was the 80s. <laughs> the 80s, okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah, early um, 80s. The most successful entrepreneur Newfoundland and Labrador ever produced. Mm -hmm. 
I want to I want to talk to you about uh, about your rela your relationship with Craig because you and you and he seem to really work so well together. It, mm -hmm. it, you know, um, and I I have a feeling. In fact, it's it's been told to me uh, by people, uh, several people actually, that you played a key role in in the success of of his business, his success in in the years after he met you. How do you uh, view that kind of uh, opinion? Well, that's quite a compliment. Again, thank you. Uh, but Craig was one of those people that uh, he had one. He had a tenacity uh, beyond the scope of most people, and he would never take no for an answer. He, when he w put his mind to doing something, um, there was no changing his mind. And don't ever tell him he, tell him that he could not do it, mm -hmm. because that really gave him, him the incentive mm -hmm. to do to do it even bigger and better. And Craig always did everything by the seat of his pants. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he, starting off, he was not a wealthy man. And you've heard the story about uh, how he built houses, 13 houses, and moved from one to the other. Mm -hmm. um, and that was before my time. So did I help him, though? Absolutely. I feel I did. I mean, there were many times, 2 o'clock in the morning, he'd say, are you awake? He'd have this brain, brainy idea. And he'd bounce it off me, um, and we'd discuss it. And he, he would just, and whether I said yes or no, I think it'd work or not. He was, he had his mind made up then. Um, but I, I tried to help him with um, um, when he did his traveling. I was always with him. Uh, we entertained a lot in our home, uh, both here and in Florida. And we, we did a lot of traveling around the world, uh, entertaining dignitaries as well as. Uh, people on the front line <laughs> in the, the helicopter industry. Mm. Um, we had a lot of fun. Uh, mm. It was a lot of work, but we had a heck of a lot of fun. Now, of all the countries you visited and all of the places you went, both for pleasure and business, um, you guys seemed to develop a real passion for Ireland. We did. Uh, why was that? Well, first of all, Craig's background, Irish, um, mine as well, and, uh, but him in particular had much stronger Irish uh, mm -hmm. ancestry than I had. But he, he again, um, when we fr I never forget the first time we went. First thing we did was go to the graveyards looking up uh, the Dobbin name and the Power name. And uh, then we did the Murphys, which was my side of the family. And from there, we w usually went in May and September every single year. Um, for s I don't think we missed a year with at least two visits to Ireland. Mm -hmm. And Craig loved visiting the pubs <laughs> and having a, a pint. Mm -hmm. And he loved mingling with the Irish people. Mm -hmm. And he had, from that point, actually, uh, he developed a, a, a big network in Ireland. And actually became um, got, um, received the keys to mm -hmm. the city of Waterford. Mm -hmm. He was the um, um, ambassador, Newfoundland's ambassador to Ireland. Right. He uh, and we entertained dignitaries from Ireland in our home, and actually they stayed with us. So it was, there was a big, big close mm -hmm. uh, rapport with the Irish. Speaking of dignitaries, one really big dignitary that you met and uh, you both became friends with he and his wife was President George H. W. Bush. Yes. Um, how did how did that friendship evolve? Well, between John Crosby and Brian Mulroney at the time, um, uh, Bush loved to salmon fish, and Brian and John, or Brian or John, I'm not sure exactly whom at the time. Uh, called Craig and asked if they would invite him to come salmon fishing. Craig said, absolutely. Uh, so we invited him to Labrador, not knowing what was going to be entailed. But before the president even arrived, all the staff had to be um, not interviewed as much. Their backgrounds had to be checked uh, to make sure there was no terrorists <laughs> amongst us. And um, actually, the Secret Service arrived before President Bush and interviewed a lot of the staff. And 
then when they arrived, oh my goodness, there were, we didn't have a very big lodge in Labrador at the Adlatuck River, and actually used to be owned uh, by the U.S. military back in the day. When they all came, the helicopters, and we knew the numbers before they got there, uh, how many were going to be, but there were a few extra in there. We ended up with 32 people for his first visit. Wow. We had to put up a military tent uh, to house the RCMP, Secret Service, and the, um, the extra staff that we had to bring on, on for, for the event. And it was quite an event. And they, um, but everybody fit in, everybody chipped in, everybody um, mingled together. Again, President Bush had the, said the time of his life. It was a pretty intimate, as intimate as it could be. President Bush would invite a couple of his friends. We would invite a couple of ours. And we'd fish, and we'd sit around in the evenings and have a nice dinner and have a few glasses of wine or whatever was the, the person was drinking. President Bush liked his wine, but he loved his vodka. Um, and so it was a very relaxed atmosphere, so you got to know him. And he then, in return, invited Craig and I back to Kenny Bunkport at the end of his season in Kenny Bunkport, which was September. And every year after that, we were invited. And even after Craig passed away, I thought that part of my life would be over. But it wasn't. I still got my invites to go back to Kenny Bunkport. And um, again, wonderful memories, intimate conversations. Then um, some, some news that I'm sure must have must have shaken both you and, and Craig Dobbin, um, I guess was in the late 90s. He was diagnosed with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Yes, yeah. And wow, you must have been floored considering the uh, experience you'd had with it in your own family. Absolutely. Actually, Craig and I were in Labrador and um, we used to walk up and down the river, uh, walk up the path to our favorite fishing hole and I noticed his breathing was becoming labored. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the season, I said to Candace Mokler, who was um, Craig's executive assistant, um, you know, I'd like to take Craig to the Mayo Clinic. And she said, I, well, Mr. Dobbin's not gonna like that because he's planning to do. And I said, no, Candace, we're going to the clinic. And um, Craig finally agreed, much uh, um, disagreement, but he, he agreed. And we went, and Timothy Wu, who was the doc same doctor that diagnosed my sister Peg, came out and said, any chance you two are related? And I said, I hope not. Now, we didn't have any children together, but we were a husband and wife. And I said, I hope not. Why do you ask? And he said, because it's exactly the same disease that your sister has had uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. You could have knocked me over with a feather. Yeah. I never thought for a second it would be that. But we went down knowing that for several years, and then he started to get worse. And we were in Florida, and I knew uh, he was having issues. Took him to the, um, no, before that, he was, we went and saw Donnie Frost. She held, he headed up the uh, lung transplant unit at the Baylor in Houston. So my, in the meantime, my sister Pat flew down to meet us, and we were heading back to our home that we had in Bessemer, Alabama. We were rented one for ourselves and one for the pilots. And, and the reason why we went there was because it was central to a whole bunch of hospitals. Now, by the grace of God, we got the call from Birmingham because if we had been in Florida, we would never have made it back to uh, Philadelphia in time. We got there, he got his lung, thank you God. And he, he did extremely well from for nine years after that, and he got an extra nine years on his life. And what's really interesting was that's when he really grew the company. That's when CHC went public. That's when he started buying, well, in order to bring it public, he started buying up other helicopter companies. And that's virtually what we did, uh, was flying around Norway, uh, Holland, Toronto, Vancouver. Uh, so. Um, Asia, so he could buy up Africa. Um, we could, he could buy helicopter companies, so he could bring CHC public. You know, as you say, mm. uh, he he lived for another nine years, and there were nine very full 
years. They were right uh, up so till just a few days before he be passed away. For. Yeah. Uh, before, uh, actually, we were invited. Um, this was just weeks before we were having this conversation. Weeks before he died, he um, he said, "We're invited to Ottawa for such and such a black tie. We're invited to uh, Quebec, Magog, uh, for a, a black tie dinner." We're invited to, and we have to be in Vancouver for the one in Toronto, um, black tie, and then we had to be in Vancouver for uh, the annual general meeting. And I said, Craig, we're not doing any of it. You're not well. You need to take care of yourself. Actually, I even called Nancy Blumenthal at uh, HUP, the lung transplant coordinator, to get her to convince him. And she agreed with me. It was too much. Um, and we j had just seen her weeks before. He was admitted into hospital in, in Philadelphia, and she said he really needed to slow down and start taking care of himself. But he was doing this trip, so we compromised, and we did the black tie in Magog because they were all close friends, and the host was Paul Demery Jr. And from there, we went to the AGM. We dropped everything else. And when it ca ta came time for the AGM, which was like, Two days later, um, he was in a lot of pain with his back. He was coughing a lot. His breathing wasn't good. And uh, he was adamant. He was doing the AGM. And I have to say, he gave the best speech he ever gave. He answered all the questions with diligence and attentiveness and correctly. And when it was done, uh, he was congratulated. And we were supposed to go to a friend's house for dinner that night. And one of the friends who was going to be there, Bobby Glass, who unfortunately has since passed away, I said to Bobby, I'm taking him back to the condo. But I'll tell you now, if we go back, he won't be going out anymore. Um, and he looked at me and he said, will you come for dinner? And I said, if we can go there from here, yes, we'll stop in, which is what we did. He called, uh, actually it was Sam Feltman. And uh, they said, yes, come now. We went. He had a great time. We left fairly early. He went to bed back at our condo. And that was it. And he got really ill. And I called Nancy in Philadelphia again. And she said, you need to get him seen too. I said, I have a doctor on the way. She said, can you give me his name? I'll speak to him. And before he sees Craig, which is what we did, in the meantime, I had a couple of nurses. Um, there were friends of mine, actually, who volunteered to be nurses. Actually, his sister, Rita, one of them, and Kay Dustin was the other. And uh, they stayed with him and helped nurse him as well. And the doctor came and said, you're going to need a blood transfusion. And Craig said, fine, bring it on. And he says, no, you have to go to the hospital. And Craig looked at me, and he said, you promised me no hospitals. I said, Craig. I promised you I'd get you home to Newfoundland, and I will. And I promise you, we, you go to the hospital now, you will be wheels up first thing in the morning once the transplant fusion is done, or trans, the blood transfusion is done. And he looked at me and he said, that's a promise. And I said, yes. We went to the hospital. I stayed with him all night. He had his blood transfusion. When I knew we were getting close to release, I contacted the pilots and said, be ready for takeoff at 7 a.m. We, he was taken from the hospital to the jet uh, by ambulance. And of course, nobody was allowed to ride with him, so I rode, in, rode behind. And we went to, the hosp uh, went to the CHC hangar out there where the jet was parked. And what a touching sight. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. To see the staff at 7 a.m., pouring raining, lined up outside mm. to say farewell, Chairman. Mm. Yeah. It, uh, sorry. But they did, and uh, that showed the loyalty they had to him, to the wonderful man, Craig Dobbin. Anyway, we got home, and uh, we were home just three days when he took his mm. final breath. Mm. He was ready to go. Yeah. Um, he had a, 
a very fitting exit as well, well-attended funeral. Mm -hmm. and, it is. And uh, it, Newfoundlanders certainly believed that Craig Dobbin had made a, a great mark on, on this province. And he did. And he did. Um, one that will always be remembered. Um, you, you've uh, met and been acquainted with and friends with so many women over the years. Um, are, there, are there any uh, women uh, that you've met along the way um, th that really impressed you or just, you know, that you admire? Well, there's a lot of women I admire, Jane Crosby being one of them, um, because she um, was for John, I think, what a lot of people felt I was for Craig. And Jane kept John on the straight and narrow, um, and without Jane, I don't think John would have succeeded the way he did. Mm. You've got, um, oh, there's so many wonderful women out there, not mm. just here. I mentioned Sister Frances Das, mm. who, um, as I said, she has very little herself, but she gives so much back to the people in her community. And I look at um, people like Eleanor Gill Radcliffe, who is such a philanthropist, who gives back more than we'll ever know. Uh, not just in our community, but in other communities across Canada. Mm. Well, Elaine, uh, I can tell you right now, there's a lot of people out there, not just women, who have a great deal of admiration <laughs> for you, Elaine Dobbin. Thanks so much thank you for Bruce. being on the program. And thank you for being such a good friend and for the invite here today. You too. Thank you. Okay. And that's this edition of Point to Point. Thank you for watching.